Hey everybody, this is Rhino, and we're back to Dear Esther Landmark Edition. So we're going through this game, looking at the director's commentary, trying to find the three remaining urns, of which maybe I won't actually get the achievement for that, so theoretically I would just have to run through this game a third time. Um, not really loving the when commentary. When I was originally thinking about how to write the music for the game, I suddenly realised that you don't see anybody in the game and the most important character as such is the island itself. So one of the things that I did with the music was to write the island as if she or he were a character in its own right. And that's really important, I think, that you're going through this space and actually it's completely devoid of people but the music in a way populates mm -hmm. the island and that the voice of the island speaks to you through the music which is interesting because i think that's really come on in terms of later games we've done that that sowed the seeds for the way in which we approach music in rapture where it was very specifically mm -hmm. the voice of characters a machine for pigs as well where the music was about being lily's voice in the game lily's representation in the game so it's interesting how looking back on Esther, a lot of those kind of ideas were, were tried out here that then came on to take other forms and stuff we've done since. It's important to point out when he says Rapture, I'm pretty sure he means the game Everyone's Gone to the Rapture, which even though Dear Esther was a critical darling, most critics really were disappointed with Everyone's Gone to the Rapture because it basically did the same gimmick. And weirdly, she is the musician and then she says I was going to write as if the island is a character which write the music I guess as if the island is a character but that's perhaps a little bit over my head as far as writing music it's like I suppose when you're talking about like music such as the Nutcracker Suite each song is accompanied by ball ballet and ballerinas dancing around and there would be a character on screen um, during that show and you would write that way but as far as a video game is concerned <coughs> very rarely is there a song in the game that is supposed to be directly connected to a character or an action the character is doing most of the time most of the music is background um, and repeatable throughout the game and yeah I definitely didn't feel like the music in this game was particularly that great if anything I think it's really really short and then fades into a lot of silence which is something that other criticism has said and that the musician has already in the director's commentary uh, pushed back on because I think they're too artsy fartsy for their own good considering how little of a like game this is and how little of a creation this is i think they're uh for lack of a better term smelling their own farts way too much here uh, and liking it <clears throat> and that's generally why i haven't enjoyed this develop director's commentary which i'm not sure that the actual director there is an actual director. It really should be creative commentary as a phrase. Um, is speaking in any of these. Uh, but there is also just an ego, certainly, in making a game that starts off as a Half-Life 2 mod and then gets remade for a commercial version, then gets remastered, and thinking that this is the game that needed to be remade twice and that this is the game that needed to have director's commentary um, when there's a lot better games out there that they never bothered to do director's commentary on it inherently the game industry fires a lot of people as soon as the game is done so bringing them back for director's commentary is often unlikely anyways uh, even fairly good successes people tend to leave the company for one reason or another all right let's talk about walking let's do it we're gonna we're gonna address the elephant in the room the very very slow moving elephant <laughs> in the room so this might be a longer um conversation because uh, it kind of fits with that 
So, Esther was the first of the, the what are now called walking simulators, um, and it was really interesting that, that for us it didn't feel that weird to have a game that was slower than normal, where actually there was lots of time to just walk around and think and look at things. And it was amazing at the time how this was seen as completely revolutionary. And um, it's really interesting. And it's amazing to see how many other games have kind of like taken it on board. For me, it was, it came from, I didn't see it as being odd to have a game where very little happened, where you thought about what you were doing. Um, for me, it was kind of interesting that you could play some of the best moments in Doom are the bits where nothing's happening and you're just doing it, or, or System Shock, or those games that I absolutely love. Those quiet moments were the really, um, the really powerful ones. But Esther is definitely slower than a lot of games. And I think that's actually why it's lasted. I think if we'd have, we did have moments where we went, should it be faster, should we put a sprint button in? But I'm so pleased that we kind of held our nerve and went, no, just as like in real life, I don't run everywhere because that would be weird. It's okay to have a game where you don't run everywhere. And actually it is a bit weird to run everywhere. But if you're gonna do that, then you've got to support it in other ways. And I think the music was a really powerful way of supporting that change of pace. What's really funny for me though, Dan, is that shamefully I'd never played a game before I worked on Dear Esther. So I didn't realise that all games weren't like this, which is now looking <laughs> back really naive. But I didn't realise that games didn't have, you know, always have, you know, this slow pace. And I thought there were lots of meditative games out there and that actually wasn't really the case at the time and that's exploded since um, but in terms of the music supporting that pace that you'd set emotionally felt really important so if you listen to the music actually the BPM is it, it is at a very slow walking speed and it just almost, I mean, there's a lot of things now that say it's called entrainment, that it slows your heartbeat, or it can speed up your heartbeat when you listen to music. And actually, I think what the Esther music does really successfully is it makes you almost accept, and more than accept, that that speed, you actually start to feel that that's the pace of your journey. And that I really like that about the music, actually. It just, yeah, it makes you just comfortable with that pace too. It, I think it just eases you into it. You feel relaxed. Okay. So yeah, the musician, the composer, the musician maker, not having played a game, isn't a one hundred percent of a problem. And I guess I would say Dear Esther probably is the first walking simulator in the sense that if I were to go back and include something like the manhole which is a game where you walk around and look at things. At least in the manhole, there's a bunch of toys and interactive points that you click on and things move and interact. Uh, you might find a book on the desk, you might flip the book open and see a page inside of it, you might close it in, in the manhole. Um, and then certainly the manhole evolved into mist where you walk around and you have switches and levers and books on the desk that you can read. Uh, inherently missed shows the exact opposite of the spectrum as far as how much dialogue could be in a small area while you're walking around. Uh, but inherently walking simulators very quickly became an insult and still to this day really are more used as a derogatory of appropriately so because it is just laziness like you've created a project that is missing some standard elements that you would expect to see in a video game and mainstream video game journalists who often seem like they have this desire to not actually spend a lot of time playing video games and not play video games at all heaped praise on it and probably as it was eventually Kind of revealed because there is a lot of mainstream video game journalists who rub elbows with a few select independent game developers and game developers who aren't independent and they all lend towards a group think about who they want to highlight who they want to promote uh, if one mainstream journalist says they love this game in their secret chats they have amongst each other um, whether it's online or in between um, like meetings or running into each other when one person says they like something the rest tend to say they like something 
that is California groupthink in general, and a significant amount of mainstream video game journalists are in California, where you just agree with everybody to get along to make more connections and rub elbows with people. <clears throat> but yeah, we are definitely on the verge of having a level of the radio mast in AI generated games there is a really that important, will be praised um, kind of design quickly as well as then immediately its derided the story. as and the that, new I think walking came from its really interesting being a Half-Life mod to begin with and the Citadel in Half-Life 2 that it tells you how far you are through the game you're always looking up to the skyline am I closer to the Citadel can I see it and it lets you know how near you are to the end of the game and it was really important because Esther's so open in a way and because there isn't this you're not using kind of shootouts or kind of gating it with with combat encounters to kind of constantly keep you moving that it was really really important that you always had that focal point of going I know exactly from the beginning of the game virtually right from the start you know where you're going you know where the game's going to end up and you know that sooner or later you're going to be either at the base of that thing or climbing that thing and it's always there that red light and I think particularly with the color palette of the game the fact that you've got this very 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 clear red light that's unlike any of the other colors in the game immediately tells you as a player this is what the shape of this thing is going to be. This is where I'm going. This gives me a purpose, even if the sort of moment by moment is a bit more abstract. Yeah, and navigationally as well, it helps you. It it, it, it draws you in the right direction as you play the game. You can never get lost if you just follow that one uh, landmark. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting place of where that sort of traditional game design is still, there's loads of it in Esther. Yeah, yeah. It's just not necessarily done in quite the same way. Yeah, I would completely disagree with that, though, because, I mean, what they're saying here is just not pr true. <laughs> you don't always see this tower. You get in the caves and you absolutely cannot see it. See it. So the next, next chapter proves them to be wrong. It'd be very difficult to see the uh, tower, but there could have been holes in the roof of the cavern to see the tower. You don't really know what you're looking at. At first, this looks like a lighthouse. Even now, it's very easy to assume that this is a lighthouse. Although, I guess maybe that's my own ignorance and that I see a flashing red light and flashing red lights would be communication towers where a lighthouse would have a spinning, um, a spinning light going in circles, making beams which visually would be more interesting. I almost wonder if in the mod or in this version of the game, the, there is some kind of Morse code happening with the beeping here, uh, or the flashing. Um, the beeping that keeps happening is my phone. I want to be notified of certain notifications, but also it's annoying and I would probably be better turning it off. Um, This is a war section, I think, as far as the variety. The text on the boat looks to be exactly the same, and the things I'm seeing in general seem to be exactly the same. And just a random change of potentially one piece of garbage being on the ground versus a different piece of garbage is, is not impactful enough that most players would even notice that there is a difference here. Uh, Inherently, I guess what you would want to do is have a situation where the, the player seems to go back to an area in one playthrough and see things differently, or turn around and then re-enter a room and everything looks visually different. I had a thought as just a potential way you could make a game in which you could have telemetrics, which video games, big video games, tend to have a lot more telemetrics than you might seem. Telemetrics, let's for simple, let's so they say, call them tracking elements. Just telling, it, telling the developers of the game, calling home over the internet how long you've been playing, how long you might have been standing in one spot, how long you've been looking at something. You could take how long you've been looking at something as a sign of something either being interesting or at least not negative, not scary, not something a player wouldn't want to look at. 
And you could make a decent horror game, say, where you would throw up, say, a bloody wall versus a dark wall. And then if you see that that player in his playthrough is looking at the dark walls and avoiding having the bloody walls on the screen, then you know, make more bloody walls. Keep it a little randomized to keep people on their toes, but you could have a self uh, adjusting horror game that way. Horror is probably the only way you can make a game like that though. Whereas best case scenario you would do with something like this is if you have a random paint can and I'm looking at random paint cans in Dear Esther, maybe you would show me more paint cans or show me less. But in the case of Dear Esther, if any of the models of things you were looking at mattered, you would randomize where they appear, but you would make it so that everything appeared once, and that would be more helpful to make sure every player has a similar experience, whereas this is a game that's kind of selling itself on the players are going to have different experiences. Uh, potentially very different experiences is what they're saying, selling it as. In reality, it seems like the experiences are extremely similar. Like all this so garbage looks the same. Something you'll notice as you look same. around the environment is, uh, you know, from a distance you see the landscape. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a beautiful place in some in some ways. Um, but <clears throat> something I wanted to bring to the to the game is that there's this second layer beneath. Uh, the surface, whereas if you look at things closely, you see that the actual island itself is very polluted, it's kind of uh, very uh, rotten. Uh, it, you know, everywhere you look, every rock, every every grass surface, it has this layer of filth on it, and it's kind of been put in there just to kind of emphasize further that this island is a really unpleasant place to live. It's like, if you scratch the surface, you see, like, just how corrupt this island is. It's interesting that these shipping containers would be depicted so um, bent. That doesn't really make sense. They should tear and snap. And in Half-Life 2, I'm sh pretty sure there is a ship and there are shipping containers. So the existence of a ship and shipping containers in this chapter I think has a lot more to do with the limitation of the original mod just using art to assets that would have been in Half-Life 2 versus them really trying to do anything new or creative in the commercial version or the remake of the version. It doesn't make narratively any sense that there is a ship here. Um, and at the very least, I would say, if you were going to have a shipping container, it should be, a, or if you're going to have a cargo ship, it should be a cargo ship full of cars. So these shipping containers should have cars that are all smashed up and on the shore. And then, even as a walking simulator, you create a problem now that since we know there's an achievement, which the achievements are doing extremely heavy lifting in this game to make it more of a game because it converts it from being a walking simulator where nothing matters to being a um, hidden object game which inherently if you were to include every hidden object game as a walking simulator Dear Esther definitely wouldn't be the first walking simulator at that point although almost m most hidden object games you aren't walking anyways we cast and did all the voice direction for Esther ourselves for the mod, and it was basically uh, Jess and I on um, a casting website, just listening to people's showreels and finding what's the voice of this thing. And it was there was never any question about Nigel. I think we heard his showreel for the first time around. It's probably been listened to sort of thirty or forty actors, and we started listening to his showreel and just both looked at each other and went, "That's it, that's him." And it was amazing when when Nigel came in. We had I think a day and a half to do the whole thing. And he just did that amazing thing that really, really great actors did. If he just walked in, got in front of the microphone, and more or less did the entire thing in one take. And we did hardly any retakes on anything. It just felt like his instinct for the character and the game was so strong. 
that he just, without virtually any direction, just came in and just got it. And one of the hardest things with the voiceover that we did was when we went from the mod, which had three potential narrative units per queue, to four potential narrative units per queue, was not only finding new bits of writing that kind of complemented and played off what was there in the original mod, but for Nigel to come back in, what, nearly five years later, and to just re-find that voice in exactly the same way and deliver it in a way that fitted in and complemented it, it was a real testament to his ability as an actor, I think. That apart from the... We had spent quite a lot of time trying to make the, the sound actually sound the same in terms of mic placement and things like that, but in terms of the actual delivery of those new monologues, you wouldn't know that that was both written and acted sort of four and a half years after the original thing was done. So the one person who's not in the room sort of today but deserves a huge amount of credit for how the game kind of eventually was delivered, but also I think in terms of how the game has lasted, um, a huge amount of respect needs to go to, to Nigel Carrington for his work on it. So, yeah, I'm still looking for the urn, which could be anywhere, including just on one of these ships in the ocean. Um, weirdly, there was a rock here the first time. And the more I look at this, I guess this is perhaps a attempt at combining a circuitry diagram into a transmission tower because it doesn't really make a lot of sense like this symbol here for a transformer would have an input and output at the top corners of it, it there would be a positive or negative at the top left and then connecting to a, a opposite polarity at the top right then the center part is just a magnetic iron core and then the other coil on the top right and bottom right are would be the other side of the transformer number of coils determining the ratio of how many volts might be dropped there but a long line going up towards a diode does not make any sense at all and and a diode at the top of an antenna it is not doesn't actually make any sense either that's not how transmission or reception antennas work they don't have diodes they are just straight pieces of metal attuned to very specific links to get the best possible signal it takes actually quite a lot of work and a lot of um, skill and knowledge to make an antenna that is attenuated and attuned or you get an antenna that reflects signals back into the circuitry and breaks the circuitry um, so but you don't particularly use diodes which would have DC voltage instead of AC voltage which is really what you would be getting in an antenna directed one way a diode resist voltage in the opposite direction to a certain point eventually it fails if you put a thousand volts on the opposite direction a long way on the diode it will still send out a voltage um, if the diode in question is not not rated for a thousand volts but yeah there's really really nothing in this section at all and even the director's commentary is just not talking about this blinking light which distracts from that blinking light and it almost implies that there would be a secondary ending to this game it feels like very little changed in that whole section and yeah the the real question and you, I really just don't believe that this is the case is if I was to play this game a second time would I somehow get different random lines of dialogue at the same spots that we triggered lines of dialogue um, would it tell me a completely different story potentially um, it if it did, it just really then reveals that the dialogue doesn't matter 
and at the end you kind of know it doesn't matter they they definitely pull back the curtain a la Wizard of Oz style and reveal that the wizard is is a charlatan and that the main protagonist in this game is just crazy um, at least in part yeah but even if it did give me different dialogue at certain prompts the game really fails to tell the player that and that's that's a big problem too like, so this, this game needs an explanation at the a, beginning a difficult thing to tell you how a it's made and how it plays the game yeah uh, in in some ways it kind of like I think for me we we wanted to have this this kind of this this pit here and we, I, I wanted to player to be able to actually go as close as possible and like look over the edge and and, and you know kind of have this feeling of, of dread and stuff but the other issue that we faced was like what happens if the player just jumps into the hole like yeah. we, we have no real death in the game and uh, from a design point of view Dan I mean I don't know what you it was really hard because yeah. we, you know it was a, a game where we, we couldn't let the player die we didn't want to have respawns but we had to handle the fact that there would be both accidents where the player would, would fall off a cliff or something, but also the deliberate urges of the player. Yeah. You know, the first thing you're going to do is go, great, there's an ocean, how far out can I go? Or yeah. there's a cliff that's really high, can I jump off it? And how do you have death in a game where you can't have the player die? Because if the player starts breaking up the experience by dying and reloading, then you're in a really, you start breaking the experience a lot. So, yeah, I mean, we, did, I, we didn't want to also have like artificial boundaries, you know, where yeah. it's like an invisible wall. Um, like if you if you take a look through the game, you'll never see a place where you think you can get to, but you can't. There's always some kind of actual natural boundary or uh, man-made boundary. So yeah, that was that was the other thing we didn't really want to create this invisible wall around this thing. So it kind of the whole drove the the way in which that sort of the the very weird audio visual, probably one of the most dreamlike bits in the game, where if you do die and you get the kind of the the heartbeat and the um, the strange flashes of visuals and they, I think in a lot of ways if we hadn't had the hole there and we hadn't had a, a place where we go right players will jump in this hole we have to start from that basis they will throw themselves down this hole it kind of gave us the impetus to really really focus on it and I think the stuff like the drowning deaths and the cliff deaths are strong because the hole was there and I'm not sure if the hole hadn't been there yeah. whether or not we'd have arrived at those that way of handling it which I'm I'm really proud of I think it's a really incredibly creative interesting way of handling a player going out of bounds and, and of actually being able to reset the game when the player's basically done something you ideally wouldn't want them to do yeah and i i kind of think it fits well with the theme of the game as well because you don't really know what's just happened yeah it's absolutely. not like it's not like you you hear a death sound and then you kind of respawn it's this kind of like very soft uh very ambiguous change you yeah know? There was a point in the original mod where if you died, it would do the whole Half-Life major yeah. fracture detected. Yeah. It's always <laughs> read a really good tone to the game. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. There's a whole symbol here that I don't even know if that was in the game original in, in my first playthrough. Yeah, you'd expect there to be an object here. Um, since you're probably in a position where you should be controlling the narrative a lot more, in this walking simulator, I think invisible walls probably would have been the smarter move instead of having die sequences, particularly since the game also, um, since the game also is just built around a interpretation, at least, that you are going to kill yourself at the end, and that's fairly irritating to play in a game where you can't die at certain spots and then all of a sudden you die uh, cinematically at the end of the game um, and generally speaking it's just understood amongst most players I think that an invisible wall is the manifestation of the protagonist taking control back and saying no this is not something I would do I wouldn't walk into the ocean and drown or I wouldn't um, I wouldn't jump down a hole. Um, 
yeah, there is definitely a comparison to something that is much better of a game and has a little bit more interactivity in the Stanley Parable, in which you have a narrator telling you uh, that you wouldn't do that thing or you wouldn't do this thing. Um, that Stanley as a character wouldn't do that thing or this thing. Um, I'm still really not seeing a lot as far as randomization. It's basically a lie it, with a small bit of truth. It, it's taking, it's stretching the truth quite a bit to say this game has random, randomly different things. Even the like writings on the walls seem to really, at most maybe they toggle on and off. But they don't seem to change. Um, it would be better, I think, if there was a mystical element to this island and it felt like there could be magic on this island too. That would just be another possible interpretation that's oddly completely missing. Um, if you were to make a game with invisible walls and the character says, uh-uh, I'm not going that way, won't do it. If they have just one line of simple dialogue, when you try to jump, that would be, um, that would be better to, to, instead of just having a full invisible wall. So for the whole, I'd say too close, you'd say too close, or you might even have a nonverbal heartbeat increasing, showing uh, stress in the protagonist character. This is once again just One a really of big the empty really area. One important jobs of a composer, I think, is to provide the player or the listener with different emotional tones and states. And up until this point in the game, the music has been very sparse, very intimate, and very isolating in a way. But the island is also a beautiful and magnificent place. And what I wanted to do at this point for the first time in the game is to create something that was really epic. So we go from that shift in scale where it's very intimate and small to suddenly realizing that this is an extraordinary and magical place to be as well as a difficult and uh, quite sad and uh, melancholic place to be. So the string players were instructed at this point um, to play with much more vibrato. Um, up until this point, they've played in a very sort of Scottish style, actually. No vibrato, very plain playing. But this was a really beautiful cue to write, actually, because it that has that scale. You suddenly realise that the island is really big and, um, it, it you know, you have this beautiful vista and the music then shifts so the player can actually, just for a moment, I think, enjoy being where they are. Yes, I think that's it. Can I... <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this is actually one of my favourite parts of the game. It's just where everything, all the elements kind of come together perfectly. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the, the music, which just is just epic, as Jess has said. You've got the landscape, which is kind of like this big open space. Um, you've got all the little uh, bits and pieces that I put into the de detail of the environment, like the movement, there's leaves blowing around, there's the clouds in the sky. Uh, there's the, the mist rising off of the uh, of the grass, and then you've got Dan's voiceover uh, coming in there, and I think it's it's just like all of these elements coming together and just in perfect synergy and just just kind of it really brings uh, you know chills up your spine. So one thing I'm noticing in this director's commentary is it it desperately needs some editing. Somebody needed to listen to it, remove the person, the cough in the previous, one of the previous recordings, remove him trying to jump in the conversation and then asking for permission. Um, yeah, that's just a way you could certainly streamline the director's commentary and sound more professional instead of it being very off the cuff. Now, in fairness, as a video game critic who is just recording off the cuff and not scripting things or editing what I'm saying, I off, often myself cough and say the wrong words and and don't and would benefit from having an editor but couldn't really afford to have an editor or uh, 
waste an editor's time. But yeah, when you have a professional product and you're getting paid for a game, you can afford to have an editor and they definitely would have benefited from it. The bigger problem with that commentary is it is 100% disagreeing with the previous commentary. And frankly, it's just talking rubbish, in my opinion. This island is beautiful. That's some kind of weird UK British overcast island that's brown and treeless and ground and, and, and just covered in sporadic plants. Yeah, I can't agree with that at all. This, this island is ugly. It's really, really ugly. Um, it's supposed to be ugly. It's supposed to be dying and decrepit. And the artist, instead of the musician who said the island was beautiful, literally in a previous recording, two, two or three recordings ago, pointed out that it's ugly, that it's covered in trash in the next to the ship, and that there is just this level of garbage everywhere. Uh, but even the natural elements, if you don't zoom in on the garbage, is not particularly good looking. I would, if you were making an island out in a different region or a magical island, you would have some peaks covered in colors and flowers. Uh, you'd have some trees up there and a tree line of some sort. Um, you would have more signs of life and, and you would just have more variety in color. Particularly, I would say, I appreciate something that is varied in its visuals and not repetitive as something as calling that beautiful whereas this game is very very repetitive hmm how do you get down there oh. interesting um, it also feels like this flashing buoy almost certainly should have been at the very beginning of the game if you're going to have a flashing buoy light there. Again, maybe there's some kind of Morse code type thing happening there. But if that was where you came from and this is where you're going, then that would make some sense. But the buoy isn't at the very beginning of the game. You don't see the buoy until halfway through this second chapter. Then you don't see the buoy or the transmission tower until the you're completely out of the cave section which when you have four chapters really the first chapter should just have been an island section this again may have just not been in my first playthrough as far as these piles of rocks or it may have just been a case that I was completely enthralled with looking at this house and not paying any attention to rocks on the ground which I would have probably just assumed were repetitive random placements of rocks anyways <clears throat> the fact that dear Esther has this house this cottage as your thumbnail as their thumbnail for for the game I think also highlights how little is actually in the game. So we can see the buoy here, and I think we're seeing like really far commentary. So maybe that is exactly where we started the game, way over there. It probably would be helpful to have a map though. come back so there I just fell off a cliff and I can't fall off a cliff to come back. hit that commentary so we have to go through this house and it must curve around at some way 
There's that. Oh, there's just a whole other section I missed. Let's see. Is there anything in here? You get in this building, and this is where he starts talking about goals, and this is where you hear that one goal. And I honestly feel like you have to find the urns in the regular gameplay. Which I find that irritating too, that you can't finish up the game uh, achievements while listening to the director's commentary. And that the director's commentary really isn't pushing you towards where achievements might be. Um, so there's a sonogram picture. So there is implications that there was a baby if you want if you get the, that picture or get the sound effect by dying inside the bothy there is um a randomized chance you can find an ultrasound picture on the table and i think it's the one instance of randomization in the game that is like the pinnacle of it because the idea that esther was pregnant when she died changes everything emotionally about how you understand the story and not say that you don't care as much if you don't find it, but it just adds this other layer of just the ground falls away from him. The first time I saw it, and the meaning of the, the, the crash in Esther's death just means so much more when you go, it's not just about her, there is, a, there is a, an unborn child here. And I think that's where the, the randomization just hits its absolute peak because it's one tiny detail that may or may not be there. But if it's there, it's going to fundamentally change the way you feel about the entire thing. And that's the strength that the randomization elements in Esther kind of provide, that you go, your likely kind of feeling about the story and your understanding about the story can be changed so absolutely by the occurrence or not of one tiny little prop detail. And that's something which, those moments, I think, are what make it really, really special. So it's, it's for me, it's, it's almost like the most important prop in the game because when it happens, it's so profound. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, again, it's just something that makes each playthrough more personal, I think. It, and it's, this is what I love reading about, you know, people finding these things and going, holy shit, I've just found this one thing that's going to change it. It's changed my interpretation completely. Yeah, absolutely. It's fairly insane to say the most important prompt, prompt, prop in the game um, is just randomized and they really counter that idea anyways quite a bit with the sound effect when you die because I had already hit upon the implication that she was pregnant just by the ultrasound sound effect when when you were dying um, what you would have wanted to do here is control the experience so more players are guaranteed a better experience by showing the ultrasound always in this bothy this house and then after that point only after seeing the ultrasound do you hear an ultrasound so sound when you die it should be perhaps a like defibrillator sound or a heartbeat sound uh, an ultrasound effectively isn't is a heartbeat of a baby but you know a more adult beating heart sound effect should play before you see the ultrasound uh, of course then you take it to the next step and instead of making a walking simulator that wants you to effectively play a hidden object game and find this object in 3d uh, it would make a little bit more sense to say walk through here and then have chest pains and have the character fall to his knees and catch himself on this table that would be very cinematic that would be a heart attack type sequence so he comes he falls down we already have the crouch animation so that would kind of work so you just have to play a few sound effects and stay in first person and when you come to this table you would then find the ultrasound and uh, pick it up and look at it 
and then put it back on the table. That would ensure that the player knows a little bit more about the protagonist and that he's dying and knows a little bit more about uh, the ultrasound sound in the pregnancy. Which, yeah. And it is going to be very variable just based on who you are and how you feel about pregnancies and babies as to how affected you would be if a car crash killed a mother and a baby versus a car crash just killing a woman. Uh, which, yeah. At some level, if you're... If you look at it fairly objectively and coldly, the number of pregnancies that that fail are actually fairly high, and women don't talk about it, so a baby dying is not as big of a tragedy as you might think if you look at it statistically speaking and coldly and calmly instead of emotionally because it happens all the time. A lot of women have one, two miscarriages that they just don't talk about before they can bring a baby to full term. So as you leave the body and the seagull takes off, that's the one jump scare in the game, which is kind of interesting because when we made it, we kind of had to, you know, we kind of called it a ghost story, but there was no intention really. We kind of wanted this dreamy, hallucinatory type thing. But when it came out, people started coming back and saying, this game is absolutely terrifying. I was really, really <laughs> frightened. And that was really amazing. And I think it's because nothing happens. We're so trained in games to go, there's stimulus all the time. That if nothing happens, you're waiting for something to happen. And kind of, I tend to talk, go back to again and again, the, the whole sequence in Dead Space 2, when you go back to the Ishimura, and it's like the best bit of Dead Space 2, because for what feels like hours, but it's probably only about 15 minutes, nothing happens and no necromorph comes at you. And it's absolutely terrifying, because it's just this space and you're just left in it. So I think the kind of the bird here is really interesting, because it can actually really, really make you jump. But I don't know if that was part of why people were saying that the game was really scary, but it was a real surprise when people started coming back and saying, this is a frightening game. Um, and I don't know how much of that is to do with the ideas in the game are frightening when you think about them, and how much of it is to do with just the emptiness and the lack of kind of things in the game make it a really quite stressful or quite frightening place. But it was a real surprise, I think, that sort of reaction from a lot of players when we, when we shipped it. That's terrible commentary because he's just admitting that he failed to properly interview and survey players of the game to understand why they would think a game is frightening. Now, as far as the jump scare being scary to me, no. Like, I, I don't get jump scared as much as the average person in the first place. Uh, but also, you just don't even really see the bird. Like, twice now I've walked past that and I've just heard it flapping by and I've I've said to myself immediately, it's just like, oh, I guess there was a bird there. Um, whereas, you kind of need to take the camera away from me and have like a bird flying right at my face so I can see it. Then be give me a few seconds or milliseconds to identify a bird as flying at my face to potentially have a jump scare. Again, if you were to take control away from the player, and have the bird fly at your face and then the character fall down again and then there's just several action sequences like that you could have more of a cinematic experience although two cinematic experiences back to back would be too close now I can only really speculate as to why individual players would have thought this game was scary but n nothing happening in it in Gone Home definitely allowed me myself to torture myself and feel like something scary was going to happen quite a bit. Gone Home does a much better job of that. Although Gone Home also plays on something that's much more relatable. Very few people are going to be on an empty island walking around. Lots of people have had experiences in big empty spaces, big empty houses, unfamiliar spaces in, in the case of Gone Home with it being dark and stormy and you're just walking around um, kind of a spooky house uh, however I would also say the fact that I have experienced gone home I've also probably 
inoculated myself to that trick for the one time that would have ever worked. Um, and if I was to play a new game, like Gone Home or this game, I almost certainly would not have that level of anxiety uh, pop up as I'm walking around an empty place. There is nothing that's really against the expectations here. Like, if you were walking around an empty island, or just walking around an island in general, where there might be people, it's not crazy to be on a path and just nature hiking, trailing, and not run into people. Um, you almost need animal sounds to have a threat of nature's bears, things like that to make it scary. You t need to make the storms and the lighting spookier as like a, there's a coming storm, which really this game should have had a coming storm. Just at the beginning of the game, it you it's nice and bright and colorful and then very quickly the clouds move in and then it starts to be a storm where the back half of the game is dark and, and stormy. Um, that too would be more relatable, but yeah. Of course, it is kind of backwards, too. Almost certainly Gone Home played Dear Esther. The makers of Gone Home played Dear Esther and learned some tricks and improved upon it, which inherently, I so guess... So one that of the things that influenced the visuals... It's quite almost a, lot was, a reset. Uh, ...the tech limitations at the later. time. Um, and also the, the kind of themes of the game. Like, tech-wise, we were never, ever going to kind of achieve photorealism. And I think that was a good thing. I mean, really, it kind of it made us sort of stretch out into other areas. And uh, for me as an artist, it kind of made me think a little bit more creatively. Um, I did a few tests at the beginning. And, I, and when I realized this wasn't possible, I kind of went back and I kind of did some research on different styles. And one of the ones that really struck me was this kind of impressionistic painterly style uh, where it's kind of like, it, there's just enough shape and color there for you to form an image, but it's it, a lot of it is just your imagination. It's kind of like the the, re, the believability of the environment is in your mind. Um, so this is something that I really wanted to bring over into the into the game, and uh, you'll see a lot of a lot of landscapes that kind of look very surreal, uh, very um, kind of unreal, and. Uh, that's mainly due to this impressionistic uh, style. I think they could have done photorealism. I think they could have done full motion video. You could have taken a camera to an actual British island and had the game have a camera operator walk through the entire journey of that area. And then that would have been a more on rails experience where you couldn't move left and right, certainly. Or you could only move left and right a little bit on the path. Uh, would photorealism help quite a bit? No, it would just be a different form of doing things somewhat cheaply. They, at least in this commercial remake version, they are doing environment and landscape and level development the normal way by asset flipping rocks and... and making a level from all of that. I, I don't know if I actually walked this way the first time I played. Um, but anyways, what I was going to say before I started the previous commentary is it almost feels like, and I don't know if this is something that maybe needs to happen in the game industry and then the whole arts, feels like a reset happened with Dear Aster in the sense that they took a lot of steps back and started from scratch to invent a video game as if there weren't decades of history of what you should and shouldn't do when developing a video game and it created Dear Esther which is an alright game but not great but then it, that allowed for other game developers like Gone Home um, other games like Gone Home to potentially lean on the, the too much praise of Dear Esther to make their own walking simulators and then reinvent the wheel 
effectively, which maybe sometimes reinventing the wheel does make sense in video games. Uh, because by the time you do get to something like Gone Home, even though that is mostly still a walking simulator game, it, it's just a lot more polished. And eventually, walking simulators fell by the wayside, and their inspiration is probably felt in other games that have more interactivity and are actually games, uh, in, as far as the video games part. I'm never a big fan when you have something that claims to be a video game and really it's just a video or a music video that's not a video game or when you have something that uh is a game but doesn't have video in it such as text-based games uh, those aren't video games either this is why well, going backwards and i don't feel like behind it um, I'm There's on a, a reason or a theme. You don't talk about stalker, kind of. Um, uh, no. Thing on here, but when Rob and I started as far talking, as I think why you have to go back kind of discovered was yeah. how much we were both obsessed points. with stalker. <laughs> yeah. Um, and. I think that was one of the major things behind it in terms of when people talk about game inspirations. I mean, for me, there's a lot of, of FPS stuff in there, Doom, System Shock, but I think Stalker probably more than anything else. And Roadside Picnic, the, the Strugatsky novel that Stalker's based on, of the idea of this, this incredible space that you didn't understand that's simultaneously beautiful and threatening. And I think sort of Tarkovsky's kind of films kind of play into that as well, oh, yeah. his version of Stalker, that you yeah. want to have this place that you feel rather than think about. And for me, that was like really kind of core to all the inspiration to the game. Is this is a space that is about feeling, not thinking. Yeah, I think the, the movies in particular. I think I hadn't watched the movies. All these plants are actually uh, 2D. I read the book and I played Just the game. But when I watched pattern. the movie, it kind of all made sense mm -hmm. to me, like why I like the game so much and why I like the story. Uh, it, it's just like every shot is like a painting. It's like every shot has its story to tell. There's very little dialogue in the actual movie itself. There's just these long, lingering shots, and the, each shot is amazingly beautiful, uh, and in its kind of desolation. And for me, that was like a huge influence. You know, like trying to bring some of that through into the environments. So that that is definitely something I'm going to struggle not to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but the game as well. I, I'd say the game, the actual Stalker game, is, has a big place in my heart. Like gaming wise, it's one of the reasons I got into game art in the first place. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that that to me is a, is a big is a big part of it too. You, you can hear in this commentary, a lot of them are heavily heavily influenced by other first person shooter games. Certainly, being a Half Life Two mod, interesting. The wind just blew all the ashes. I wonder if that is the trigger to these urns uh, so maybe I did collect that urn and then maybe I would be able to collect the other urns in the game um, but the fact that the game artist is heavily influenced by things like System Shock, Doom, Stalker uh, Stalker perhaps lesser known in the United States uh, and easily confused with the Chernobyl series too. Um, I guess if we found the one urn, we really don't need to look for anything else, so we can kind of rush to the end here. Um, those kinds of first-person shooters, and this being a Half-Life mod, really just smacks in the face of how this game is not like any of those other games. There's no shooting here, there's no violence here. The stories in Doom and Half-Life, and I, the stories in Stalker is actually based on a novel, so I imagine the story there is kind of pretty good. But generally, in Doom and things like that, it, there's just a big bad guy, and there's just an excuse to have a lot of encounters and fights, and that's just not what this game is. This is a game that needs a lot more narrative, and this is a game that would have been a lot better is this a spray bottle spray paint bottle it looks like it would have been a lot better if they had some influences in reference of visual novels and the writing 
reflected that by being more of a story and more of a narrative. That's where something like Oxenfree, I think, does a much better job because it is focused a little bit more on the story and Oxenfree also has puzzles. Again, getting away from walking simulators and being only slightly inspired by some of the elements in walking simulators, which are a lot of the elements in walking simulators already existed in, in other games. So again, it may be redundant reinvent reinventing the wheel that didn't actually contribute too much to the general public mindset, public domain mindset of how video games tell stories. Um, notably, Bioshock is heavily influenced by the writings of Ayn Rand or reactions by Ken Levine to the writings of Ayn Rand. Um, so, and then plenty of games are then inspired by Bioshock. So, the iterative process of creating games and video games is very much commonplace. You, you do rip off ideas quite a bit more than I think movies or books even do. Uh, video game makers tend to borrow and rip off other developers. But yeah, their inspirations, them talking about Stalker, them talking about Doom, really tells me that they what they really would have wanted to do is make a shooter on an island in a Half-Life mod for that. But that wouldn't have worked. I wouldn't be surprised if the same people who made the original mod of Dear Esther also did make a bunch of Half-Life 2 mod levels and none of those are uh, anywhere as well remembered or received. Uh, notably Gary's mod, which is really just a goof around physics mod for Half-Life 2, is the most common and well-known mod for Half-Life 2 uh, compared to any mod that would just have added a new protagonist, a new story, a new set of enemies, or a new level to fight enemies at. One of the more in, uh, interesting and, and challenging things to do in the, uh, this boat, again, the visual side of things doesn't make is any to sense kind to of me. create a, a, an emotional connection with the player. Even um, with the music, it, it's it's very strong, and and the dialogue can kind of help you to 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 feel what the character's feeling, but to kind of really create an atmosphere and to create emotion, it's very difficult. Um, so I, I designed a few things very subtly within the environment to kind of plant imagery into your mind and kind of uh, make you feel uh, certain things. Um, with this shipwreck on the beach, you can kind of like, if you look at it from certain angles, you get this real like, uh, uh, like it's like a cross sticking up. It's this kind of semi-religious imagery, but it, it really kind of it's it's not obvious. It's not in your face. It's just kind of like something that makes you feel like something you know. And uh, so, like, there's a lot of lot of uh, deliberate attempts in the game to to recreate that feeling, uh, and it's it's kind of hard to point out in many other places. But it's it's done in a way where every every single rock, every single plant, every single cliff face has been deliberately placed and designed in a way to try and make you feel something in the game. This guy is just really terrible. If anything, I suspect the way they did this commentary is not the way you usually would do a commentary, which is you would have some outside party do research and have questions ready to go and then these questions would be asked and then the questioner would be edited out of the response and so it would actually be a question and answer response generally i think you probably would also do a lot better if you'd been taking questions and answers at like game events if you'd gone to e3 and uh done a speech and taken questions and an answers at the end of that then you would have taken your footage of those questions and then thought about your answer rewritten it for an even better answer and made that part of the director's commentary 
there is a real problem when he is saying that every single plant, every single rock is intentionally placed to make you feel something when the game is also selling itself on some objects being randomly there or being randomly different. Uh, religiously, there, there really isn't an interpretation in the story I experienced around religion. I don't feel like Esther as a character was crucified or sacrificed for anything. It's just a tragedy that she was dying and certainly I guess you might say it's a tragedy that Jesus died on the cross but I don't feel like the full there's a full comparison there it would make a lot more sense if you're gonna have a shipwreck which again I suspect there's a shipwreck here just because that's an asset a visual asset that already existed in Half-Life 2 um, although a wooden boat in Half-Life 2 might be somewhat questionable um, it would make a lot more sense if there were barrels of rum where there was more of a hint towards alcohol uh, even if the character talked and spoke and said it's a shame that all this rum has long since been leaked out um, but yeah we don't really even get a feeling that the main protagonist cares about alcohol enough to be the drunk driver at the end we don't see a bottle of whiskey anywhere in this house we don't see um, anything like that Let's see is this bird yeah just a dead bird on the ground which that certainly could have been spookier if we saw more of that but yeah if anything you would have Esther more depicted as the Madonna and you might see the Virgin Mary the Madonna depicted in on, on the walls or something like that as uh, as her being a mother could be hinted at more there um, geez I wonder if there was always dead birds in this si section um, more than her being sacrificed which just it just doesn't make any sense unless there was supposed to be a narrative here that I just totally missed that she was dead or near death and uh, her heart for instance was used to save you uh, then she could be sacrificed but even at that if that's not really believable certainly there's not a case in the time that this seems to have occurred where if they were bringing in a corpse of Esther and you the protagonist from the same car crash that they would use her blood or any of her organs as donation organs or anything like that This is another of my favourite bits in the game where you come along the edge of the, uh, the sort of gully and you find hundreds of books and it's one of the first times where most explicitly there's the suggestion that nothing you're seeing is real because there's just no way that this can exist and it's a really amazing uncanny moment but it works I think for me because you just go I don't understand it but it's lodged somewhere in my head and I can't get rid of it and I can't unsee this and I think for me like in terms of my influences from, from books, I mean, there's the obvious sort of stuff like with Burroughs, Cut Up and things like that going on. But it comes to the kind of books that I really love that like Roadside Picnic or the other one by the Stragatskis as well, I absolutely love is The Ugly Swans. That's just full of these images that you go, I don't understand. I literally have no idea what's going on here, but I can't shake it. It's just got its hooks in me. And I think more recently you've got books like um, Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation does this so well where nothing is understandable, but you feel the logic, but you can't understand the logic, but you, you feel like the logic's there. Um, and that, I think, is a really powerful thing that games are so good at doing, of creating these things. And I think where a lot of game writing for me becomes kind of the wheels fall off it is that they have these amazing ideas and then suddenly there's this huge rush of going, right, we've developed this mythos and we've shown you all the tips of the iceberg, which are really interesting, but now we're just gonna show you the whole iceberg. And actually, 
that's never that satisfactory as a player because it robs the mystery. And I think the best game writing is those those kind of moments where you go, I feel like there's something just outside the edge of my vision or just on the edge of my hearing. But it's the confidence to go, that's it, that's all you get, and the rest of it is up to your imagination. And I think it does loop back to games like Stalker. I think Skyrim at its best does it so well, where you just have these moments where you think, I want to know, but it's going to be down to my imagination to draw those things. And the player's imagination is the most powerful thing you've got in your design kit. There is nothing you can put on screen, there is nothing you can do with audio, there's nothing you can do with dialogue that will ever be as powerful as the player's own imagination. So if you oversell the idea and oversell the image, what you're actually doing is you're kind of not only robbing the player of the opportunity to invest in the game, but you're also fundamentally opting for a weaker tool than what the player can bring to the experience themselves. Yeah, again, I, I feel like this guy it thinks he's smarter as an artist than he really is. Like, first of all, because this world looks fairly realistic and, it, and this suitcase looks fairly realistic and these books look fairly realistic, I don't feel like there's an unreality feeling to this. Honestly, it feels very believable. Somebody threw a bunch of a suitcase that would have been full of books down here and the books scattered or they just threw a bunch of what looked to be the exact same book over and over again. And I just can't, with the watermarks, which are present on every single cover in the exact same place, read what that first word is. It's something Britian history, which I assume maybe is Britain's history. And then as far as the pages that are open, it's all the same page with what I assume that's supposed to be a outline of the M5 highway in the UK. Um, not so sure exactly what this is. It looks just like clothes. But yeah, they'd almost it would almost make more sense if it was a bright and colorful uh, game closer to Half-Life 2. To see books and make it stand out as oh this is weird because when you see realistic books and papers in realistic backgrounds not th that seems very believable um, and that's repeated in every se sequence where we do get into one of these dead ends and see some object um, is that it just feels believable it would make some sense in my case I wouldn't just go bright colorful cartoony visuals on things that are randomized or important but I could see doing a pearlescent hue around objects like the books um, certainly the prompts for the director's commentary are bright and colorful and they stand out as not being real but yeah if you just had a little bit of a glow, a little bit of a, even a white highlight around the objects, that would make the objects seem to be more standout and more important. If you want it to feel standout and, and important, I'm not sure that really is the goal you should have. Um, inherently, I question whether making this game and this island feel unreal adds anything to it particularly in this remastered version if there was a different version of this game um, in its original forms that was more cartoony maybe that would improve my reception on it um, it would be interesting certainly if this is perhaps the only example I could ever point to where remastering a game and making the visuals look better actually potentially hurt a game. Uh, but there are definitely some examples of things you would never see happen that would hurt a game. If you took, for instance, Super Mario Odyssey, the most recent big Super Mario game, and then had it remade in a very brown, natural 
dull color palette instead of the bright colorful uh, cartoony color palette that Mario is made in. If you changed Mario from being a very round cartoony Mario into a hyper realistic um, Unity or Unreal Engine style character that wouldn't really benefit the goal of Mario and that really wouldn't feel like a Mario. In contrast to that, Zelda games. Like Zelda has gone quite a lot of different directions in the way Link is a Link since there's been at least two or three of them uh, has been depicted. We've had Wind Waker Link who is very short and cartoony and, and rounded. We've had 8-bit Link from Legend of Zelda uh, for the NES who's just small and pixely. We've had Breath of the Wild Link who is still bright and colorful and cartoony but much more towards a realistic body size proportion and in a much more realistic world um, so if you were to go even further in the realism way of depicting things for Zelda games it might be slightly more acceptable a hyper realistic version of Breath of the Wild wouldn't change too much a hyper realistic version of Wind Waker would probably change quite a bit but most of that would all also center around nostalgia and even this game maybe remastering it smacked in the face of nostalgia and that this game really should have still been a source engine mod when it was when the commercial version was made and really sh should have still used the original art assets and and had a more faithful um, remastering of the original source mod versus a full-on remake which is what I think the commercial version did and then we now have a remastering of a of a remake which also highlights the problem that's going to plague video games as we go forward and that things are just increasingly going to get remade and resold and repackaged over and over again almost done this has gone longer than one it should of have. the really important images in the game is the radio mast they're and really the not talking that I about any the of the sound really effects tied into this idea so it's the the concept of the tortured sounds that are the so, so broken down this, they're so and can't even see the radio mast and at it this really point. is supposed to represent the inner state of the protagonist at this point it's that fractured understanding so it kind of works on two levels actually we have the narrator who's trying to understand the journey that he's on and we also have the audience's journey and their struggle for comprehension to understand what's going on in the game so this distortion this breaking down um, this fragmented kind of tortured sound really ties into the idea of the radio mast and the idea of communication actually that the game is trying to communicate something to you, the narrator's trying to tell you something, but it's so difficult to understand what that is. It's really ridiculous to talk about the radio mast as we're entering the cave and we're no longer going to see the radio mast. Yeah, and this would be kind of the point where it would probably help if there was a hole in the ceiling and you could see the radio mast point you here. I'd also say since they're cutting out the audio dialogue in the director's commentary version of this game it probably would also have been helpful if they cut it cut out the random sound effects but the random sound effects are probably just labeled the same way as ambient noise and music is and honestly turning all of that down might have been helpful. There is an argument for live games to have mod mods for them where you could just take your hands off the controller and the game would play it for you. Particularly in this director's commentary, it almost would make sense to speed up the walking process and just have everybody walk, uh, have the game walk for, for you from point A to point B. Although then I would miss out on the urns, and I have now gotten one achievement for the urns, so if I can get 
the remaining two achievements, then I would only have to play the first chapter to get the last audio point with the director's commentary off and get the first urn, which didn't trigger for some reason. Uh, we have now listened to 29 out of 59 of the director's commentaries, by the way, um, which is to say we have heard more dialogue from these three directors and the creatives than we have as far as the voice lines almost there was 34 in total of the full voice lines um, and undoubtedly the amount of things that are said even though I'm disagreeing with probably over half of what is being said um, and see this is a cinematic sequence where it looks like an eyeball did that thematically mean anything no it's just like the cross it, it doesn't really mean anything did losing your flashlight mean anything no which feels like there should have been a reason that losing your flashlight should have been more impactful um, you lose the flashlight pretty much just because the game doesn't want you to have a flashlight in this cave um, because that would change how they're going to visually depict things do all these stalactites and the cave appearance mean anything not really yeah. At now playing the game a second time you would think that I'd be getting more more story or more of an interpretation of the story from it but it's just not really happening it's random things because they were the things you could actually create making in Half-Life mod limiting yourself because you don't have the skill to make an actual game and Valve, I think, does deserve some blame there, certainly, in that the Source Engine allowed a lot of people who to make games when they weren't really qualified to make games. Steam Direct, later on, much later on, also created this situation where a lot of people could try and sell games when they really didn't have enough skill to, to really enter a marketplace as big as Valve. Uh, most small independent game developers that are just learning before Steam Direct would have had to put their game out for free on something like Newgrounds or itch.io or something like that. I think Newgrounds was a place where you could post, post games. I might be wrong about that. Uh, different storefronts definitely that most people wouldn't ever look at. Uh, it's not just Valve's fault. Like Macromedia Flash had that same problem and then it was way too easy to animate and way too easy to make interactive games uh, that led to a lot of garbage games and maybe that eventually inspired some actual people to try harder and actually program games using better engines like the Unreal Engine or the Unity Engine in the past uh, I can't recommend it now um, but yeah as somebody who took programming classes in my schooling and at one time wanted to be a video game programmer myself I am fairly happy that the classes I took were C++ classes learning the programming language you actually would need to program the mechanics of making a video game um, instead if I had taken a Macromedia Flash or if the schools had offered um, a half-life modding class, those students would not be given the proper tools and the proper way of thinking to make a game. What I was not taught and would have helped me more is a history on video games and an understanding of what video games had been developed and what the thought process and the ideas on there. A video game appreciation class would be fairly helpful for people who want to make a video game. A lot of people feel like they made video games because they liked 
three or four video games when really you should have played and liked hundreds of video games to have a good reference um, in the same way that a movie appreciation class is very helpful for people who want to make movies and honestly it's actually very would be very helpful to have a like static art music movie uh, book novel uh, creative writing classes having classes for every form of media to appreciate or just a media in general appreciation class would be very helpful for all creatives because it does definitely cross a bunch of lines you can be inspired by a rap song to make a video game you can be inspired by a static painting to make a video game and vice versa um, all art is somewhat derivative and borrows from other creatives so the most amount of creativity you can engage with the better um, but yeah starting from the perspective or the limitation of I can make a Half-Life 2 mod I can't do any arts and I can't get anybody to do any art element so I'm only going to use the 3d models and the visuals from Half-Life 2 um, is really a point where you should admit you just alone don't have the ability to make a real video game and that's why we call mods mods and video games video games is that there is a difference there uh, and a lot of it is going to come down to just rallying other people who have other skill sets to work with you and that can be incredibly difficult to to particularly in the past nowadays if you're going to make a game like dear aster you probably make it on the Godot engine. You'd probably try to make it open source. You'd probably try and call for other game developers to work via like GitHub to have the source code open source and add tweaks and add changes and try and create a team. You probably need to have more leadership skills than you would think you would need to try and wrangle that team and get everybody working together. Um, and that would be very much the best way to have a longer term development of a project. If you could make a game like Dear Esther very shortly, which you could, since it isn't that long of a game, uh, you might do a game jam also. And that, that's one of the few good reasons I think game jams exist, is that it allows other game developers to work together, form small teams, and make small uh experiences in 24 or 48 hours that being said game jams almost 100 percent about game developers meeting each other and working together and maybe learning a few programming tricks they're not really about having a finished product so i'm not a fan of seeing game jam games released on steam even if they're free because i just feel like steam is not a marketplace for what are experimental projects or educational products i feel like steam is a storefront to sell commercial products only um, and people certainly confuse that sometimes but yeah dear esther definitely you can make a game like dear esther in a game jam with a team of three or four people in 48 hours um, particularly since most of the people at game jams know how to program and know the basics already anyways this episode has already gone really long so that's going to be it for this recording as always i ask you to like share subscribe comment and watch every second of my videos if you want to support me further there's a link down below in the description thank you for watching have a good evening